thanks very much today um, for coming today, Grafton. Um, it's really, really nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's the normal thing that you do at this stage, right, is to ask some kind of question about, you know, what, what led you to this project? What drew you to Vaporwave? That kind of thing. But the problem with that question in your case, right, is that you spend some time um, uh, talking about how difficult it is to actually conceptualize Vaporwave, to limit it to a single thing that one could even be attracted to. And so I might ask you first to sort of talk about what was the thing that you were attracted to in the thing that we call Vaporwave and how might you sort of begin to typify its kind of sonic or visual aesthetics, that kind of thing. Um, So a kind of double introductory question, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I got turned on to vaporwave a little bit later than probably, um, you know, than, than many others. It was, it was 2011 or 2012. And, um, I think my introduction to it was through tiny mixtapes, which at the time was, you know, really to me writing pretty interesting, critical, work on music and, and introduce, introduced me to a number of different artists who were just not doing what everyone else was doing at the time. The early 2010s was, you know, this, the two thousands were pretty terrible musically, you know, and so <laughs> the coming at the end of that was just this burst of, of, um, indie bands, very white, very yeah. synthesizer heavy kind of, politically neutral it seemed like and sure. um and and much of it was just I, I found to be really boring and frustrating actually i remember there was this tumblr at the time that i've i've since i've never i've never been able to find it since but it was called something like where is the protest music uh <laughs> which it was there of course but like but there was sort of a feeling around 2010 2011 that uh that there was just no need for popular artists to uh, make, you know, challenging music that either had a political message or were, was, you know, aesthetically challenging. Sure. Um, and Vaporwave seemed to just, just kind of do all of that in, in my mind. And, um, so when I heard it, I was really drawn to it. I, I, I became slightly obsessed with it. So my desire to write on it came from just a general fondness and admiration for the genre, which I, you know, um, would get my friends together and play it for them. And I would be like, do you like, listen, to this, what do you feel like? This is strange, you know? And a lot of them got it and sort of, uh, you know, if, if they were around my age and grew up sort of at this, this um, transition period between, I don't know, you might call like the CD era or the weather channel era and like the streaming era. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's what, you know, that just a general fondness for it, uh, that surreal, um, you know, uh, foregrounding of, of older media, those qualities really, really appealed to me. And so there's sort of like working towards a bit of a definition, you know, back then when I wrote it, I, I really didn't, I didn't see the need to, um, to define it in the book because I, I was honestly, I was slightly afraid that it, that, at the time, there, there wasn't really a consensus that vaporwave was a genre. At least to some people, they kind of saw it as a meme, and and like most memes and the you know the viral ecologies that we have today, they they're supposed to kind of come and go. You know, they right. they peak and then flatten and um and uh. But I I wanted to think of vaporwave as a genre, just like any genre you could you know hip hop, rock and roll, you know, um and uh. And to try to like give like a definition of rock music or hip hop seemed a little s- strange to me. And uh, so I didn't really want to do that with Vaporwave, but th- it certainly has like um, characteristics. And in years since writing Babbling Corpse, I kind of wish I had maybe uh, typified it a bit more because what has happened over the last few years is that it's uh, been increasingly confused with Another genre that we could certainly talk about, which is sometimes called synth wave or retro wave, um, uh, but those those are two totally d- different genres, and we could kind of get into those differences. Yeah, I think it's it's quite interesting. This um, this kind of it, it seems to me quite 
um, often now that actually the idea of vaporwave has become relatively. Um, I don't want to say reified because I think that's a bit pretentious in this scenario, but let's say solidified, right? Around a kind of almost single version of the aesthetic that kind of got sort of um, it, this kind of viral attention, right? Broadly speaking, the floral shop um, Macintosh plush album cover, right? Mm. You know, most people, when they think of Vaporwave, I think now, right, because it became this meme uh, and wasn't critically engaged with by people who, you know, wrote for like, I don't know, Pitchfork, although, you know, um, you know, those kind of more legacy, let's say, um, organs of music criticism, right? Um, I was sort of, I, I struggled um, as someone who sort of has spent a little bit of time thinking about Vaporwave, you know, if I wanted to give a kind of political appreciation of it, right, actually identifying the ways in which it was it could be defined by any kind of single aesthetic right seemed like you know if i wanted to describe to someone hey you know this kind of use of um the kind of appropriation of this kind of weird 80s muzaki synth right is not as radical as i think you know potentially this one over here is in the case of vaporwave i was wondering if we might if you could sort of start to sort of see what was it about sort of vaporwave specifically right um uh, uh kind of either aesthetically or in the way that it was produced right that to, to you kind of distinguishes it uh in some instances from kind of other genres which you don't find exactly as kind of uh politically or aesthetically challenging or productive well when i first was listening to some some of the earlier like uh, classical vaporwave um records a lot of it was available on sites like Bandcamp, um, and uh, and was also, as you say, kind of ignored by mainstream legacy press outlets. Um, and of course, that that gave it a you know a, <laughs> sort of this underground appeal or what have you. And as a young person, that was really um, attractive to me. Uh, and uh, but then listening to it, you know, and and. Uh, you know, thinking about just how laser focused the genre is, or at least yeah. in, in its earlier forms, you know, and um, seemed to me that that it was something that could be potentially um, created relatively easily um, among different groups of people and and or having one person create multiple projects under multiple different aliases and putting it all over Bandcamp. Um, uh, was also attractive, and um, so to me, I mean, I think that that the the the, the best vaporwave uh, takes it. It starts at the source material, really. Um, if there's sampling, or if even if there's not sampling, trying to recreate sounds that were meant to be on the periphery in um, mm. previous decades, eighties and nineties, uh, maybe even early two thousands. So the sounds of, you know, loading screens, DVD menu screens or um, commercial bumpers, uh, what you might call just like Muzak, you know, or elevator right. music, interstitial music, things that are, are are meant to not necessarily be listened to, but are, are meant to uh, serve a purpose, which is for a lot of Muzak to kind of uh, condition laborers to work more efficiently and to be calm and, and, and all of that. Um, and, and to me, something like synth wave or retro wave, which, um, is often confused with vapor wave, at least in the press occasionally, um, right. and on social media is, is that it's source material is quite different. It's, it's meant to replicate, um, you know, the, the, the more mainstream and popular and, and, you know, blockbuster sounds of, of the eighties and nineties. And, uh, so the source material differs and then, and then the treatment of that material differs as well. I mean, I, I think about, uh, vaporwave as being characterized by kind of looping circularity. It's, it's, it's not linear. It, um, there, there's a repetition and, uh, I think that it calls attention to gaps in, in media and memory and, and the ways that those gaps kind of constitute one another. Um, 
And uh, to me, that was most fascinating as a, you know, college student at the time in my early 20s and the early 2010s when, um, you know, I moved off to college and and lived a uh, kind of a bare bones life with my laptop and that was it, you know, like, and not really, you know, doing things like I used to do, which was like watching cable or watching TV or listening to the radio in my car or anything like that. And Vaporwave quickly reminded me that those were things that not only that I did, but that uh, created, they had very specific experiences. I had specific experiences with, um, and in a way uh, foregrounded the, the fact that different media create different life worlds and that um, one could perhaps even be a little nostalgic for, for, Mm. for those life worlds. And, um, but the interesting thing about vaporwave is that it always, or at least, you know, the, the, to me, the, the best vaporwave, uh, would always kind of call attention to the strangeness in, involved in that process of, of remembering. Yeah. There's a great deal there. Right. So it, I want to start by sort of thinking about what you, what you said about the gap there, right? Because that seems to be something <clears throat> that is surely distinctive of, of vaporwave. Right. I was thinking about, um, you must have seen them, these remixes of like uh, contemporary um, tunes. There's one of that um, one song by The Weeknd and Ariana Grande. I can't remember what it's called now, right? But and all they would do is like feed it through some kind of 80s of fire, right? Mm-hmm. You, and they're on YouTube. They've all got kind of millions of views. And what seems to right, distinguish Vaporwave is that if that is kind of the, a purely kind of humanistic, smoothed over kind of um, of nostalgia vaporwave as you kind of say in the book has something of the kind of inhuman about it right because of these gaps because of these weird processes of sampling there are you know um these kind of uh repetitive shopped up samples yeah which which kind of draw attention to the non-necessity of the kind of way that we traditionally think about music and I'd, I'd kind of like to sort of ask a double question about that, which is, you know, what do you mean by this kind of inhumanness or non-humanness to Vaporwave? And what's the kind of potential political radicality to that to that kind of move away from the kind of hyper-humanist version mm. of nostalgia that we get kind of in the, uh, in the kind of contemporary music media and press? Mm-hmm. Well, um, yeah, the the concept of of like the the gap or the glitch in in media and in in memory has always been really interesting to me. And I, you know, they like I said, they kind of constitute one another. And I think vaporwave um, illustrates this pretty well. The gaps in our in our media impact our memory, uh, you know, and and vice versa. The 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 glitches in in media, uh, you know, lead to loss of information and 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 and, uh, you know, um, and then in some ways when older analog technologies disappear, you know, or when they, at least when many of them kind of, I mean, certainly we have like vinyl records uh, that are selling and even CDs here recently have had a, um, bit of a resurgence, but, uh, it can be quite easy to, to forget some of these technologies in the digital age. It was like, like I said, like when I, when I sort of went to college and, 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 and left my home that kind of had some of these technologies incorporated in my daily life, it was like they never existed. And Vaporwave sort of called back my attention to them and reframed them and made me kind of pause and reflect on their limitations, you know, and also possibilities. Um, but, you know, in terms of, um, in, in terms of some of the, I guess, like the, the, stuff I wrote about in the book about the inhuman or the non-human or more than human, uh, you know, I, politically I see that as kind of a sustained critique of, uh, of like technocracy, which, you know, is called into question today, uh, a little more casually and more frequently than maybe it was 10 years ago or so with the, um, I don't know, like the the great man discourses of the early 2010s that were yeah. kind of like circulated through pop culture, through things like TED Talks and Apple events. And certainly these things, these things still happen. But I mean, that was such a 
a prominent, popular uh, genre, and um, and and it it certainly I think it served companies like Apple and Facebook really well uh, right. to say like you know um, the new way of doing things is to put you know a white guy in a in a uh, turtleneck on a stage and and they are they are wizards they're prophets and right. um, they have given us a technology that was like the equivalent of like the end of history in 89 you know this this right. is going to solve the problems you'll you'll never have the problem of of disconnection you never have the problem of anxiety and loneliness of uh, ignorance you know this this is going to open all the doors and uh, a, a major um uh, I guess like strategy to market this idea was, was through these, like these, uh, genres of, of public speaking ultimately. Right. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and to me that, that, you know, individualized and put on the, on a pedestal, these, these lone actors, right. um, and, uh, that just was really frustrating to me, <laughs> you know, like the, uh, yeah. the, the genius, um, you know, the, the genius, genius sort of figure. And, uh, and, and so to me, um, I don't know, vapor waves anonymity and, and it's surrealness was, uh, just didn't play that game. And, um, right to me, I, I really, I, I, that appealed to me. So what I'm getting is it's the idea that Vaporwave constitutes a kind of reframing of our um, kind of everyday aesthetic encounters, right? Such that by kind of chopping up um, uh, 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 these samples, um, whose origin we will, I, I should imagine, we'll try and get into kind of in a little bit, but chopping up these samples in such a way to produce gaps, which kind of challenge the kind of reaffirmation of kind of what I imagine Fisher would call Oedipal or Oedipod, I think he calls it, um, kind of mm -hmm. capitalism, right? Which um, sort of tries to give this kind of fresh, furry, friendly face, right? Um, in place of the kind of plain inhumanity of technology. But is it that you think that I mean, I, I'm interested to know whether you really think this is, um, you know, Vaporwave is pointing to the fact that capital, um, this kind of non-human agency, I think, which ultimately is called capital in your book. Um, uh, is it calling attention to its force or is it, and is that the mode of critique um, or is it, or is it some kind of other mechanism? Um, uh, I suppose that's the kind of question is, is whether it's saying that there is a real non-humanity to the production of Vaporwave in a sense. Is it actively criti critical of the concept of the human or is it kind of a, God, I wish we were still human in that more kind of move. I mean, you know, the, the technology and the media, they're always, you know, human. They're right. created by human, humans. Um, sort of encode their biases into the technologies. There, um, you know, s somebody somewhere creates the algorithm, right? Um, and then behind the algorithm are laborers known as content moderators. So there's always there's always a human, there's someone who creates the machine somewhere right. on the planet. Um, it has an extremely uh, not you know not not just a material impact, but a but a human impact. And and mm. you know this is this is a major. Uh, criticism I had with thinking about uh, these sort of more um, these strands of philosophy that are always trying to decenter the human, which was mm. interesting to me at the time, but certainly I I would kind of saw it as a, a reflection of some 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 tendencies uh, or like maybe like a reaction to certain mainstream discourses of the time. Um, but you know, I even I say in Babbling Corpse, you know, the, the problem with maybe um, trying to think non-human or, or decent of the human is that you can pretty easily kind of scoot the human aside and absolve it of any blame. And right. at the same time though, completely centering the human and saying like, it's everybody's fault that uh, the climate is doing what it's doing. Well, that's just not necessarily true either. And, and we yeah. know from countless data that 
uh, you know, capitalism, global capitalism, certain people within mm. those systems who are far richer than others are the ones who do a greater damage to the environment than, you know, my grandmother who never drove a car, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, um, so, you know, uh, I, I think that that's, I think, and I think there's sort of a feeling too, like, like it, a lot of times existing in, in capitalism can kind of feel like that you're being worked on virtually from some, by some unseen force, you know, sure. that's sort of what, what recommendation algorithms make life feel like. And, and that's kind of the, the weirdness felt by, um, you know, uh, technologies like mobile phones and smartphones and, and, and whatnot is, uh, these little companions are very strange. And, and, the the way that Apple and, you know, Google and related companies sort of sold this idea was uh, not just to say, hey, they're going to solve a bunch of problems, but also they they kind of are like, they're sort of a part of you and you can integrate them in right. your life very easily. It's pretty seamless. Um, and to me, my reading of Vaporwave was that, you know, all technologies, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, an iPhone or or an, an old radio, you know, they, they do sort of... Um, almost seem to have a life world of their own. They really don't, of course, but, you know, it could kind of seem that way. And and um, even the digital technologies, which seem to be the most, you know, seemingly glitch-free and smooth and shiny and um, and without strange, you know, hiccups like, a, like maybe like a rabbit-eared television might have had back in the 80s. Um, but they're still, they still have their own strange worlds and they still have their, they still can produce their own, weird feelings in us. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes some technologies, that weirdness is a little more, uh, apparent. And I think this is something that Jeffrey Sconce has written pretty brilliantly about in his right. book, haunted media. Um, also his most recent book, the technical delusion, which is great as well. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, the, the iPhone has its own weirdness. The cloud has its own weirdness. It is, it's a strange thing to, um, have your, uh, a data breach, steal your identity and like leak all your information or have everything that you've ever saved in the cloud completely disappear, you know? Sure. Um, so maybe we can have a, a genre of music that can one day kind of call attention to, to, to that weirdness in the digital age. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder what that would sound like. Right. Um, uh, I, I, I think, I'm kind of interested in, sort of picking up on this uh, and just having a look a little bit further at the kind of the historicization of Vaporwave that you give. There's a really interesting moment where um, you sort of talk about the kind of concurrent rises of Vaporwave and a philosophy which you variously call and gets variously called speculative realism and object-oriented ontology, which I think were the kind of trends that you were referring to. I, I, um and I'm just quite interested in, and, if, and it's not so much a question about the relation between the two, but that both apparently seem to rise at a similar time. And both have now sim seemingly kind of moved a slightly away from the spotlight in some, re in some regard, right? You know, there was a period in time where you couldn't move for something about kind of uh, my Sue's after finitude or, you know, Ray Brassier's Nile Unbound, right? You know, everything seemed to be about that kind of philosophy. And in, in some ways, you know, there was a time on the internet, uh, on somewhere like Tumblr, where you couldn't move for Vaporwave. And I wonder, is there kind of, was there kind of a critique of the non-human or it was there a kind of non-human moment that might have now passed um, uh, uh, in some way? And, uh, uh, and, and um, if there is, um, uh, uh, and it's a good thing, how, how do we kind of reawaken that uh, or, or explain its fall? Um, well, um, to me, the the, and this is probably because I'm I'm my background is more in cultural studies and film studies and and less in in continental philosophy. But to me, the the interesting, th I guess, things about object oriented ontology and speculative realism and and these sort of mm. you know terms, um, the some of the artistic trends that they right. I, maybe spawned or the, or that were in some conversation with 
were a little surreal and and sometimes mm-hmm. interesting. I mean, I, you know, I think about the the middle of um, Timothy Morton's book Hyper Objects, in which they right. have these these um, examples of of different pieces of visual art mm-hmm. that, in some sense, um, kind of uh, help do the work that Morton was was talking about in that book. To me, I think that's that's just k- kind of um, interesting as, a, as an artistic trend, I guess right. you could say. Okay. Um, politically, in terms of its philosophy, it's like I said, I, I you know, um, I think it definitely had its moment. And, um, right. and I think that, that one, one of the best critiques of <laughs> object oriented ontology came from, um, Alex Galloway, who is, um, yes. yeah. you know, just one of my, um, very influential on me as a, as a thinker. And, um, and uh, Alex wrote this um, piece called "The Poverty of Philosophy," yeah, which he pretty much says that you know uh, different philosophical trends mirror kind of the the I guess you might even say like the systems that that you know I guess maybe bring them into being and yeah and he had a real problem with uh, the idea of object oriented ontology and object oriented you know processing or or what have you in, in computer coding. Um, sort of seeing that that strand of philosophy is almost like a um uh the result of a of a technocratic society and and yeah. the pre- previous societies of of steam and whatnot had their own philosophical trends and um anyway i thought that was that's a really interesting critique but you know i'm not sure if it's something that i would necessarily dig into much uh anymore to me it's a like we say it's kind of a uh indicative of a time um, yeah. and, um, but, but still some of the, you know, what we might call like art in the Anthropocene or something, some of that is, is just kind of interesting to engage with. There was this one, um, I think it's called the museum of the history of cattle. And I, 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 I forget it's many, many years ago and it, it was meant to be sort of a, um, history of, of cattle from the perspective of cattle. Of course, human <laughs> beings create it. It's the, one of the issues with trying to think the non-human is you're, still human, but, yeah. um, but it, it, to, that was really kind of fascinating to, to right. see just, I don't know, it was almost like a, just a bit of a reframing to, to think historical processes a little bit differently. Hmm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about all this, this kind of moment, which, um, sort of, I, I, I guess people now refer to as the blogosphere, which is, you know, now being supplanted by the podcast sphere, I guess, mm. uh, you know, um, uh, and I'm just thinking about, you know, one of the, one of the key kind of conceptual moments in that, which of course I think is sort of played a greater role in your kind of more recent work and probably plays a slightly greater role in babbling corpse, right. Which is this question of hauntology and nostalgia, which it'd be really great to talk to you about, you know, exactly what you, well, at first mean by those terms, right? I'm sure you've been asked to define those terms variously, but they get kind of bandied about with sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a kind of frightening lack of conceptual precision in lots of ways. So it'd be great mm-hmm. to, before we sort of try to talk about in what ways we think vaporwave might be hauntological or nostalgic, get a hold of what we actually mean by those terms. Yeah, and I and I agree. And I, I think that's um, one of the reasons why... Um, a lot of my writing deals in some way with nostalgia because it is a, it, it is, or it, it just gets thrown around, you know, yeah. it's almost just like a, um, uh, sort of a, a category that can, that can be employed and, and used in whatever way. And, right. and in some ways that is the definition of it. Um, but you know, I, I just, uh, I had a book come out, uh, a few months ago called the hours of lost their clock yeah. and it is meant to kind of pin down what nostalgia is and its political usages and whatnot. And um, I see nostalgia as an emotion. So it's no different to me than um, anger or sadness or joy, which of course, even those emotional categories have been um, thought about by different scholars. And you've even got some who say there is no such thing as these basic emotions and Mm. not that nostalgia is necessarily a basic emotion, but it is, I see it as an emotion and, you know, even though there are different words for something like anger and, and its definitions change through time, it doesn't mean we can't throw the word out. I don't think just like we can't 
we shouldn't throw the word society away, even though right. we're not quite sure where society begins and ends or, you know, we don't need to necessarily throw away anger or the word nostalgia, I think. Mm. Um, and so I see nostalgia as an emotion. Um, its definitions have changed through time. It's a relatively easy emotion to kind of situate historically because the word itself doesn't show up until 1688 in a, in a dissertation by a medical student. Um, and, uh, and then from there, it gets sort of used in a variety of different ways to, uh, in, in many ways, prop up certain prejudices. It's, it's used, it's, it's was used, um, it was denied from groups of people in order to control them. And then it was hoisted on to groups of people in order to control them, you know? Right. Um, and it really wasn't until probably the latter half of the 20th century that, um, advertisers started to really notice that, that, that people do enjoy feeling nostalgic and that they may even part with their money if they um if they feel nostalgic so and then you get things like american graffiti which are extremely successful film yeah. and so so and, and so that's kind of where we are now and now there's nostalgia everywhere and it can be really frustrating but um so i to me i see nostalgia as an emotion ontology is a little, a little difficult and uh i think that Part of that is because, of course, Derrida just sort of, you know, makes a pun of it in mm. Spectres of Marx. But it's, I think it's really, uh, I think Mark and and Simon Reynolds were both um, onto something when they started to pay a bit more attention to it. I, over the years, and this is something I've, I haven't, honestly, I haven't thought too much about. So it's, I just bear mm. with me here if, if this sort of collapses under any kind of logic. But uh, <laughs> I've seen a hauntology as, as something one does. Um, right. I think of it as like a reading strategy almost. Uh, I think uh, like almost like a way for critics to approach texts um, and for artists, maybe like a way to approach form uh, for musicians, a way to approach their form. Um, it's kind of like, not in terms of what it does, but kind of how it operates. I see it kind of like Donna Haraway's cyborg. It's more of like a verb, like uh, one, I think like looks, quote unquote, looks for haunting in texts, like a critic approaches a text with certain assumptions in mind. And those assumptions would be, you know, language operates, you know, through differons or in the trace or any of these Duridian concepts. Right. Um, absence instead of presence something is always a duplication but it's always new it is always coming back for the first time etc mm, yeah yeah um and in in doing hauntology it, the idea is that one would like a, attend to the ghosts if you will right. um to listen to them to speak to them like like uh derrida talks about with um you know horatio and, and hamlet yeah. Uh, in the name of doing some kind of justice and, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I might even, you know, this is, <laughs> this might be <laughs> committing a crime, but, uh, I almost see it as like a method of, of a critical method that, that we might use to engage with texts in, in certain ways. Yeah. I think that's actually, you know, in many ways, I suppose that is closer because it, you know, people forget that it's an, that it's an ology. Right, um, that it's uh, for Derrida, and you know, it's it's obviously a pun on the study of being, ontology, right? And so maybe we could just think of it, uh, think of it like that. I mean, I, I'd be interested then to think about what is it that you see as potentially nostalgic or hauntological about vaporwave, specific in the kind of the sorts of music they sample, right? Um, from what kind of uh, let's say, um, you know, um, spatial contexts, this concept of the virtual plaza and, you know, temporal context, right, which is to an extent that of nostalgia. I'd be interested in sort of what would, if hauntology, right, we're going to take it as a kind of way of doing or thinking about art, right, um, and, and therefore about politics, you know, what would a hauntology then, a vaporwave kind of look like and how would it reveal a kind of nostalgia or lack thereof, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would think that, uh, well, for one thing, to, maybe to to go off a bit of the last question of like what, how nostalgia is somewhat related to hauntology, I think it's a part of the emotional process of like doing hauntology. Like I think that um, 
there are a group of emotions that are involved in doing hauntological work. I mean, certainly there's there's talk of mourning for lost right. futures. This is sort of the thing that Mark yeah. talked quite a lot about. So there's kind of a grief maybe involved, um, but certainly a a kind of nostalgia, you know. And and sometimes you could read Mark's work mm. and see the glimmers of his nostalgia because I think that the work that he was doing. I think he was doing ontology. He was, for one thing, he was looking at certain texts. He he made the decision to um, look at texts like Sapphire and Steel, you know, for example, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. The Shining, yeah. And um, and then to read them in specific ways, in order to make certain comments about uh, about politics, uh, you know, and art too, but mainly make to, to make these political assumptions about um, futures that were were ultimately foreclosed that maybe were dreamt of by what he would call like popular modernists or whatever. And that were sort of, um, stifled (laughs) ultimately. Um, and, uh, so I, so I think that there's, you know, nostalgia is a part of that. One could, one could look at, at, you know, texts from the past and say like, you know, there was something there and it would be really cool to have that again. Um, and maybe I'm going to approach that and, and see what I could do to um, think about, you know, interesting futurities. But but the first step might be a little bit of nostalgia. And I think that that sometimes is a weird thing to talk about because nostalgia is such a such a bad word and is so, you know, associated so strongly with like conservatism, which is just, you know, there's a wealth of writing out there that that does not associate it with conservatism. Um, yeah. And, and plenty of instances in which it is, of course. But um, so I think, you know, in terms of the way that some artists like Ramona Xavier, who is behind, you know, Macintosh Plus, for example, right. um, how they may, you know, approach the the music of the past is in a sense, I think maybe a way of doing ontology. And I'd have to like think that through a little bit more, but it's got something to do with looking into the gaps in which the ghost sort of like the figure kind of appears or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, and, and bringing that sort of into the present and, and allowing it to, you know, quote, speak and repeat, you know, um, the haunting itself being sort of a repetition constantly. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I see Vaporwave as, as, as kind of doing ontology and then, and then to study it in, in a way that, that thinks about issues of absence and the ghostly and the spectral, I think is also a way of kind of doing ontology. Yeah, I think I think that's got to be right, and it, it certainly seems like vaporwave. It's you know sampling is in a way a kind of a process of excavation, and if you wanted to be all spooky about it, you could say it's a process of conjuration. Mm. Um, you know, and and I'd be interested. You write there's this quotation which I absolutely love from the book that vaporwave is the music of non times and non places because it is skeptical of what consumer culture has done to time and space. The bulk of Vaporwave is critical of late capitalism at every stage of its production, from its source material to the way the music is distributed and sold, if at all. And I'm really interested in this kind of, especially this idea of the the non-time or the the non-place, right? Because it's the sort of thing which, again, like something like Hauntology, could easily get get thrown around. But I think it receives quite clear exposition in this book. And I'd really like you to talk about potentially how Vaporwave uses its kind of sampling and excavation it's conjuration to kind of evoke and play with your nostalgia to make you realize you know potentially something about our culture Mm -hmm. yeah to 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 uh yeah to almost create you know almost like a a consciousness raising or something to use yeah term that also that mark sort of threw out a little bit um uh later in his writing but uh well the the idea of the non-place that's um, that's a concept from Marco J, and he wrote in the 1990s a a book uh, called Non Places, and um, and he you know he describes the non place as this sort of anonymous place of transit that sort of has popped up in hyper modern capitalism or not hyper super modern capitalism, uh, airports, malls, grocery stores. There are places that um you know, you kind of pass through, uh, there's no identification that happens with, within, like within the movement of these places, it happens upon like entering and leaving. Um, he says, 
And he also says that that the proliferation of these non-places, it, it's a result of what he calls like the acceleration of history, right. um, which is the feeling that history is just kind of like has has cranked into high gear. And this was in the 1990s. Certainly it sort of, sort of feels that way today. Um, but he said it's this kind of public desire to give, to historicize events pretty quickly after they happen in order to give them some kind of meaning, in order to create some kind of meaning. And he says it's not that there's uh, too much meaning or, or like a lack of meaning in the modern world. And it's that there's sort of an increased need to give the world meaning. Um, and right. it comes from this pressure that's kind of bearing down on the present from the past, the great moments of like the last century, the world wars and such. Um, and, and also in some way, like a consequence of the end of history of 1989, where if global capitalism truly wins the day and there's, there is no history anymore, right. um, then that, that's a really, that could be a really anxious feeling for the public. And so there's a, a need to kind of like try to ascribe meaning. And, you know, in the face of that, you've got capitalism doing its thing and creating, uh, destroying in some sense, like the sense of place and erecting blank parking lots and strip malls and that resemble all the towns sort of look the same all over the world, you know, anywhere there's right. capitalism. And, um, and the aesthetics of vaporwave are meant to uh, kind of draw attention to um, the non-place, which in the early 2010s, some of these were starting to kind of disappear a little bit, like the mall, for example, which, you know, I, I wrote about in the hours of lost their clock that the indoor mall is a, is a privatized space. It's a space of consumption. And yet there is strangely enough, sort of a nostalgia for the indoor mall that's shown up over the last 10 years or so, because even though it replaced like any sort of public space where people can gather and and speak freely and and interact um the point of the mall being that you get you go in to be able to purchase you know and as douglas rushkoff has said there are all these techniques to try to get you to stay and purchase longer and whatnot right. um at the very least it was a place people can like congregate and, yeah. and hang out to a certain extent sure. which is so strange to think about that that and i i've thought about this a lot too in the in the pandemic where um that just kind of went away you right. st- start you might miss the old days of shopping in an indoor mall you know even though we know what the mall was and what it took away and i think that vaporwave um and sort of you know taking source material of music that you might hear in a mall making it sound like one is hearing it in a mall um it's sort of like that's a way of sort of resurrecting the spirits of the mall and not just like the ghosts of yesterday's shoppers but also you know, the, the voices of those who were completely paved over by the mall, right. like the fact that the mall itself is um, literally built on these exploitative supply chains and, and labor and um, sometimes built to top, you know, places where there have been crimes that have been buried literally. Right. Um, and uh, very much like, you know, yeah. a poltergeist metaphor, the voices yeah, yeah. of the business owners who own their own businesses disappeared in the wake of the mall. Um, the local people who watch their communities turned into gentrified spaces. And then once the mall dies, it's kind of dead zones, it's sort of blight of capitalism. Um, to me, that that's sort of maybe some of what Vaporwave does, at least with the sense of of place, which is really the sense of, of non-places. Yeah. And, and I think it's it's something about, you know, cutting that idea of any kind of you know, if the mall is trying to reproduce a kind of sense of reality or groundedness, right? Um, so there's something about vaporwaves, kind of um, what Fisher kind of calls kind of crackle uh, in, in, the, in, in the context of kind of a- uh, Afrofuturism and what, you know, Kodjo Eshin sees in the kind of um, it, 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 in music, which kind of foregrounds the artificial, right? Uh, it seems to me that vaporwave kind of cuts um, uh, you know, in presenting itself as so unbelievably unauthentic, kind of in many ways makes nostalgia impossible because it it means that it tells you that the mall was never really there. The mall was always kind of construction, um, but you've kind of, you, but uh, it, it, it was never, it was always a non-place. It was always in a non-time. Um, uh, and I, I guess that's, 
what to me I, I got out of reading Babylon Courts to an extent is is a, a kind of foregrounding of that in in necessarily in authenticity uh, of the world, the necessary alienation that capitalism uh, capitalism gives us, and then vaporwave throws it back back in capital's face as a kind of uh, it, by kind of parodying it and you know making it a fit, figure of almost kind of ridicule, which I guess gives rise to the kind of simultaneous humor and horror that mm. you know you can feel upon re- like listening to vaporwave um yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah and i think that you know the um i mean the the thing about nostalgia is that it's it's sort of um by definition a kind of inauthentic realness and sure. it's very strange there's a tension there and um i have to get asked about like what is it if you have nostalgia for a time you didn't live through or a time that didn't exist? And I'm like, well, it's nostalgia because ultimately you're talking yes. about some, you know, so the, yeah, for one thing, you got plenty of evidence of people who yearn for times they didn't live through and that sure. they experienced secondhand through, through media. But nostalgia is in some ways sort of like uh, longing for almost like an alternative fiction. And a lot of times that, that the past itself being a kind of fiction that we have to create only later on and mm. um and interpret and revise and often have to struggle against those who are trying to write it for once and all you know and um yeah. and 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 so nostalgia works very similarly but you know it um the mall for all that it is you know it's like i said i mean it you know who is it billy eilish who ran through the mall in one of her recent recent music yes, videos like i think so like there's a there's a reason for that you know and and um it's if if she wouldn't have done that if people thought that would have been stupid, you know. And so right. there is a kind of like, especially, you know, in the in the in the COVID pandemic, a a a longing to be social and and to some extent a a recognition of like, well, you know, the mall is a site of commerce, but I saw my friends, <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah, um, sure. it was it was better than no place at all, and and um. And to have to have to keep those competing thoughts in your head at once that it's good and bad at the same time, I think, is far more productive with thinking about nostalgia as a as a so socially shared and shaped emotion than saying, well, it's always good or well, it's always bad, you know, because we know it's a little more complicated than that. And and uh, I, I don't know, I think the mall is such a um, one one has to wonder if the airport will end up that way. You know, I mean, yeah. who would ever be nostalgic for an airport? But I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah, no, surely no one. But maybe that's because <laughs> no one gathers in airports. Maybe, maybe yeah. something something to it there. That's the but, ultimate pass through place. I mean, at least yeah. you know. I mean, the whole season, I don't know, three or four. I can't remember. Stranger Things revolved around the mall. You know, yeah. Which, not you know the grocery store you know so yeah for sure and i i like i i, I remember watching um that series of of stranger things and i was listening to you um talk about it um uh, uh somewhere else as well and it reminded me of the kind of uh, of the overlook hotel in so many ways right in the sense that it's like this necessary it, because it's it's kind of out of time but it's it's kind of a uh a, a you know, the it's a construction that we kind of tell ourselves to kind of um, as a kind of um, comfort, as a kind of a, a, a temporary luxury, right? You know, you get the you get the ballroom in the Overlook Hotel, and you get I don't know, I don't <laughs> for the UK, so I don't really know what balls are like. Uh, we don't really have them over here, first, but kind of whatever you know, the places that we people would gather in the uh, in malls in the US, right? Um, and it's it's kind of a a temporary um, uh, respite from presumably the, what you were doing just before you got to the mall, which was work, mm. right? Um, and right. there's and and you know because it, at least it was a zone of enclosure where you got to be social. And if you know if you were attending the mall, right, um, you weren't uh, working there. Um, and that's interesting mm. to me. Is that all the nostalgia for the mall is is very rarely in the in vaporwave. It's about working there. It's about the this idea of the the imaginary mall in which no one is really working, right? Mm-hmm. You're just walking through, picking up this donut, right, and buying mm-hmm. these clothes, and no one's really there, right? Um, and so, it, it, to me, it seems like a, it's a nostalgia for 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 a kind of a, a feeling of, uh, of 
of of kind of freedom from work i guess which mm. which is kind of typical of uh, of kind of fish fishery and politics i think mm. um yeah so um i suppose i wanted to ask you know a little bit about um the kind of the relation between babbling corpse and you know the more recent work the hours of, uh, of lost their clock because there was in Babylon Corpse, you know, as much as you sort of diagnose Vaporwave with this nostalgia, it seems to be, a, 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 you know, it seems that you, you think that we can have a kind of a cynical relation to this nostalgia, right? Where you sort of say this nostalgia is kind of built into us. It's something which capital has to reappropriate, right? It's the only way that it, it's kind of serves a predominantly ideological function. But in the eyes of, maybe I sort of, uh, that's a misreading, but in the eyes of Lost Fair Clock, towards the end you really start to see some kind of political potential to nostalgia or perhaps you start to see it more explicitly and i you know i I wonder whether what exactly your optimism is about nostalgia and about the politics of nostalgia right um uh, and how it's connected to this this idea of hope which uh seems to be floating around a little bit more these days right um uh, and i'd really like to know has your uh, uh, kind of perspective on that shifted and if it hasn't, what is it that has, you know, uh, that sort of draws you to the political radicalism of nostalgia in combination with an idea of hope? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that <clears throat> my uh, my position on nostalgia changed over the last several years. And I right. think um, most of that came from engaging a bit more deeply with it and, and looking a bit more historically at it. Uh, and so, you know, in, in Babbling Corpse uh, and some of the early writings, the, um, you know, nostalgia isn't always talked about very kindly. Mm. Um, but I try, you know, I tried to say in Babbling Corpse that it is a part of the process of, of, um, of listening to that music and experiencing it. Because um, I felt it even back when I first heard it. So, yeah. um, and, um, but the i think that you know well for one thing the 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 big you know nostalgia wave to use um mm. a term that's been used before uh of today really you know i, I mean i think it's it, to call it a wave is, is a little difficult but if we had to and we wanted to talk right. about like the start of the pandemic in in 2020 which sort of unleashed nostalgia if you will yeah. among among the the public in the west and um but for a long time i mean like really since it was first named um the uh there's been sort of a mission to end it once and for all you know right. and um so for 200 years until like the really beginning to middle of the 20th century even um there's this effort by uh, doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists to cure it out of people because they saw it as an impediment to progress. And of course, progress being an extremely technocratic capitalistic yeah. concept. And so anything that stood in the way of that was a problem and had, and had to go. Um, but of course, who were those people? Well, they were, you know, it was sort of like nostalgia became the lens through which one could look and channel old prejudices or something. Sure. And so it was, um, it was, uh, African-Americans and Reconstruction and Jim Crow. And it was, um, you know, of course, young women, uh, the youth, you know, right. uh, and, uh, and immigrants, people, you know, there was this like, is it a good thing to move or not, you know? And mm-hmm. if one moved too much, what's the problem with, what, what might they bring, you know? And um, so it, it was used in, in ways to, to condition and control populations for a long time. And, uh, like I said, not until the middle to the end of the 20th century when that sort of changed. And and in some ways, that sort of reflects the change in what, you know, Foucault might have called a disciplinary society to the society of control in Deleuze or something where, right. you know, we're not so interested in like, you know, you know, beating the nostalgia out of you. We want to cultivate it a bit because it's actually good for business, you know, because if right. Disney buys up all the media companies and it's the last corporation left, well, it, never has to make anything new ever again because it's got enough intellectual properties now to reboot forever and always. Yeah. And, um, and, and appeal to, you know, 
people's nostalgia over and over again. And, uh, and, and so there's no, there's no effort to, to get rid of that, I guess. But, uh, but see, the thing is like, you know, whether to end it by force or to end it by giving people what they always want the past over and over again. So they're just like, it's Mm -hmm. almost like, you know, um, one reboot after the other, what might actually like get you back to the past. And therefore yeah. there's no longer any separation or, you know, if you always have your memories saved on the cloud on your phone, you can never disconnect from them. You can never move on because once that moving on occurs, then there's the distance, then there's the nostalgia. So there's right. always sort of a, you know, society always wants to end it, you know, completely. And, um, and what happened was is in March, 2020, it pretty much proved that incorrect. Right. Because suddenly you had people feeling nostalgic like crazy, you know, right. uh, suddenly, simply because things change so quickly and everybody's locked down and fear and anxiety and nostalgia tends to be reactions to those feelings. Um, but, um, you know, the idea that nostalgia is conservative or reactionary is really a product of its it being used by reactionary conservatives over the years, you know, um, as sort of a foil to maybe like liberal technocratic discourse about progress or something moving forward. Um, and, uh, uh, when there has to be some sort of like, I don't know, maybe like some kind of, some kind of middle ground between the two, uh, because to, to really prove that one should never be nostalgic is to prove that there was never anything in the past worth, you know, having a fondness for, which is something I uh, was just f- forgotten, sort of very out of print uh, philosopher or theologian named Ralph Harper, who wrote this book in the late 1960s about nostalgia. And it's actually, it's crazy just how, um, how uh, adamant he, and, and like, I guess like politically charged he is about nostalgia's capacities. And this was, you know, 50 something years ago, 60 years ago almost. Uh, and he makes that same kind of argument. He said, you know, the idea that that uh, that human beings should accept change for change's sake in the name of progress, we ought to know that 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 is code for like police state, militarism, right, uprooting, you know, and and that and and that to to be nostalgic to save something from the past in the wake of the future that might come and just destroy it completely is actually a, a legitimate. Um, uh, legitimate feeling i'm not sure if i'm rambling now at this point but <laughs> no i don't think so i mean is, is it i guess is it kind of a um kind of a necessary um i suppose nostalgia necessitates a kind of critique of uh, a critique of the present right that's the, that's the kind of idea right in order to be nostalgic you have to think you know these are no longer the good old days right yeah um, some, at the uh, very least something is is like impoverished in the present, which I think is a is a is a nice starting point, because right. if one were to say the present is super good, yeah, is to miss the point. I think so. Maybe maybe it's that, isn't it? It's like um, so. Even in its most kind of cripplingly corporate forms, right? Nostalgia. You know, uh, I kind of like that Silk Sonic record, that collaboration between Anderson Pack and Bruno Mars. But that is just because it's a recreation of music that I like anyway. Um, mm. um, but. Mm. Uh, uh, but um, but you know it, necess- it necessitates you know something about the 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 if you feel that you are no longer home, which is of course mm. that you know that the kind of more literal psychological meaning of nostalgia. I take it uh, from your work right. um, that necessitates an identification of where home is and when home was. Right. And, and it's already an imagination of, a, of an alternative. Right. And a challenge to the kind of necessities of, of kind of corporate capitalism. I mean, right. is, that, is, is that something like the idea of of what nostalgia could do for us today? Or? Yeah, because, I, you know, I, I think that I think that there, there's an anxiety of nostalgia and rightfully so because when you know donald trump shows up on the stage and talks about making america great again everybody understands the subtext there right, right. you know yeah um and uh and and doesn't want to do that because the idea is that that somebody might get elected that might quote wind back the clock sure um and and roll back some pretty important gains 
Right. Um, and in the process, hurt a lot of people. And we mm. obviously don't want that. And the thing is, is it's not necessarily a, a problem with wanting to sort of, you know, uh, you know, maybe revive something in the past. It's more of a problem of of what gets revived, who benefits from that revival, and who right. gets left out ultimately. You know, sure. And so, you know, if power wants to say, "Man, forget the past. We're going forward," and that means we're, you know, we're building strip malls and uh, more invasive technologies that surveil you and um, crypto or you know whatever. Yeah. Um, but if they want to say, actually, you know, we're just going to fold time on itself and we're going to bring back some horrific things that everybody thought maybe had died, you know, whoever kind of holds the power can can do whatever, can do either one or both mm. at the same time, you know. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that a, 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 uh, a future-facing gesture or a time-folding gesture uh, is necessarily bad. And and there's some there's some really excellent, writing on this, you know, like, um, by nostalgia scholars over the last, you know, 20 years or so, you know, I mean, this is what Svetlana Boyan was talking about in the early two thousands. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this writing is like behind paywalls and, and, and really expensive academic books, but there's, it's just a really interesting stuff on how, you know, um, if we are to deny nostalgia to people, as like a possible emotional resource, well, we might not be any better than the ones who were trying to cure it out of people a long right. time ago. And it might not be the the right thing to do because um, you're going to have communities everywhere who are going to, um, I mean, just like right down the road in Atlanta, Georgia, in which it's gentrified to a degree that is just, I mean, it has it doesn't have a sense of place anymore, except in these pockets that you kind of have to seek out to find. And these local communities are completely... Uh, you know, displaced, not in terms, literally in terms of place, but in, you know, their, their local signifiers are gone and it deprives them of a sense of history altogether. And so are they to yearn for that past? I, I would, I would imagine so. And in fact, there's some research to indi- indicate that. Um, and, uh, and that yearning to say like, you know, I've got one um, horrific looking apartment complex after the other around me that destroyed all the old homes and, um, you know, got rid of all of the local, you know, businesses and places for me to go get my groceries or whatnot. Um, and they put up a giant stadium that, you know, uh, uses more energy than, than countries in Eastern Europe. Right. Uh, <laughs> and there was a time we didn't have that, you know? Yeah. I think that's a pretty, that's a, that could be a, a, a useful tool to, uh, of resistance, I think. Yeah. I think, I think that's gotta be right, hasn't it? It's the nostalgia, you know, when a certain person has a certain nostalgia, right, it stops the idea of kind of a consistent linear line of progress, right? Um, because I've said a while ago that, you know, it's quite, you know, you don't, uh, in queer circles, you don't really get nostalgia because, you know, queer, queer folk tend to have nothing to be nostalgic for, right? In the UK, right, it's like, you know, the 1980s, you were, you know, we're not going to be nostalgic for uh, the, the 1980s because it, necess- it necessitates being nostalgic for a time of kind of Section 28 where it was illegal to mm. talk about to promote homosexuality in schools, right? Um, mm. And and so, but maybe kind of nostalgia um, when it's viewed from a place of kind of subordinated knowledges in those kind of Fuc- Fuc- that kind of Foucauldian sense will sort of remember those moments of kind of exploitation and appropriation that um, that kind of when Donald Trump says, make America great again, uh, you know, that's not what he's thinking about, right? Um, he's thinking about the continuation and the rep- repetition of that. Uh, mm. So maybe it's, there's something there about, um, you know, nostalgia and how it kind of displaces this idea of continual capitalist progress. Right. And it was actually an excellent book um, of, uh, an edited book of of work on queer nostalgia uh, by a scholar named uh, Gilad Padva. Oh, nice! And and it, it's it's really excellent because it 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 has it manages that tension, you know, with right. like nobody is nostalgic for the uh, the conditions that led to massive persecution of queer people, you know, or, right. or the Jim Crow era and its and its lynchings and and so forth. And yeah. um, um, but but there are certain you know nostalgic aesthetics that might get 
reincorporated in contemporary uh, queer art or or a certain nostalgia for even um, collective action, you know, and, and drawing upon uh, not the conditions that led to the collective action, but literally, you know, what Naomi Klein would call like the dreaming in public, the coming together as, and, and trying to like, you know, um, yeah. try to exercise the right to protest in democracy that is constantly trying to be, sure. you know, uh, thwarted by, yeah. you know, the police state or what have you. Um, and, and I think those are, those are really, uh, you know, rich texts to in, engage with and, and to think about, you know, and, and to remember that, that, um, that I, I don't know, like the denial of, of, of human feelings, even at the social level, that sort of are only really felt in relation to one another, you know, is, is, can be really bad ultimately yeah. and, and can, can help to cultivate the positivist technocratic subject, which we know, man, that, that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, no, for sure. That's not going to be sustainable. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's nice to uh, end on a kind of optimistic note. Whenever you read these things about hauntology, they often end up being kind of pessimistic to the level <laughs> of kind of being, you know, all, almost impossible to read, I find sometimes. But it's it's been mm. really nice to finish on a kind of an optimistic note. I'm anxious that we've been going for some time. Um, so uh, uh, I'll just thank you again, Grafton, for sort of coming on and talking about this book. Um, and is there anything at the end that you'd kind of like to promote or anything like that? Or? No, uh, thank you so much for having me on. This was really very engaging. I'm so glad to be able to, you know, revisit this book and, and Vaporwave and think about these things, how, how they've changed and yeah. what, what stayed the same, you know? Yeah, wonderful. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on. Cheers. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. See you guys.